All right. Well, turn, if you would, to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter number 3. We continue on in our message series uh, as we're going through the entire book of Revelation, verse by verse by verse. Um, this book, as, as the entirety of Scripture, uh, is a mirror. And uh, sometimes, if you're like me, in the morning, the last thing you want to do is look in a mirror. Uh, sometimes you look in the mirror in the morning, and you're like, ooh, wow, that's not the same guy that went to bed last night. What happened? Something, something terribly went wrong through the night. Uh, but it's amazing what some hot water, some soap, and a cup of coffee can do. Uh, but uh, the, the, God's word is a mirror, and it shows us exactly who we are and what we need to work on and so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to briefly, very briefly, we're going to touch on eschatology um, in this particular chapter. And of course, it'll become very prevalent as we, as we go on through the chapters. Uh, we're going to touch on it very briefly in this chapter. Uh, most believers, many, I don't say, many believers, very, very uh, well-learned believers, uh, seminary professors, pastors, and so on, um, and I'm not saying I have that kind of scholarship, but many struggle with eschatology. They know that there is a rapture, right, uh, a snatching away of the saints, of those who have passed as well as those who are alive, right, First Thessalonians 4. The, the problem is with many is they don't know when, when it will be, and I'm not talking about a date uh, as far as the tribulation goes, as far as the great tribulation goes and when that rapture. And there's many that will say, well, we as believers, we have to go through the, the great tribulation period. And that obviously, I, I could see and I have read their opinions on that matter and where they draw that conclusion. The problem with each and every one of them that I have seen that hold to this, well, you could say a, a post-tribulation rapture, um, they never incorporate Leviticus 23 into it. And folks, if you don't know Leviticus 23 and God's calendar, and in particular the fall holy days, you're going to struggle with eschatology. Uh, You've got to know the holy days. Unfortunately, what has happened in the Christian church is that so many believers have been taught, well, the holy days and the, and the law and all that, it's all been done away with at the cross. And, of course, when it's not taught and it's not understood and it's not lived out, well, of course, you're, not, you're going to struggle with eschatology. Uh, but we'll uncover all that stuff as we go on, and, and I'll show you, according to Revelation, according, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, the Gospels, as well as Leviticus 23, uh, f- God's holy days and how all that is worked into his future, his calendar, and when these uh, events, at least uh, on a, on a, on a uh, which comes in what succession, that will we'll touch on all those matters as we go along. But let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start. Abba, we thank you once again for the day. Certainly thank you for your word. Thank you for those who are here. Bless us in spite of us. Open up our eyes and our ears. Lord, there's many, many truths um, that, that are in this, this passage today that we need to examine ourselves and look at it and certainly pray for the brethren. And pray for each other. Pray uh, for a revival even amongst ourselves. We ask all these things uh, in Yeshua's name as always, Lord. Amen. Amen. Beginning of verse 1, to the messenger of the congregation in Sardis, write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregation. Mayam Chaim. So Sardis. Sardis um, was the capital of Lydia, uh, Roman province. Very important city. Uh, was well known for its trade, well known for, for its commercialism. Uh, Sardis housed a 
uh, a Roman military outpost. Sardis was well known for the cult of, of Artemis. Artemis. Artemis was the god of nature, the god of birth, the god of death. Uh, Sardis was well known for its manufacturing, uh, the manuf- manufacture of woolen garments and so on and so forth. Right? By the time John is writing this book, send it off to Ephesus, and of course the neighboring congregations around in Asia Minor. Sardis was a shell of its former self. And the congregation that was in Sardis was a shell of its former self as well. In Sardis, you had a very significant and influential Jewish population in Sardis. They were so influential and they were so wealthy they built themselves a 300-foot th- big, large synagogue. 300 feet. Now, you think about it. The next time you turn on the TV and you see an American football field, that's 300 feet, 100 yards. That's how big this synagogue was. And they built the synagogue, of all places, next to the gymnasium. The gymnasium, mind you, in the ancient world was the center of Greek pagan culture, and the gymnasiums, more often than not, were located right next to the, guess what, pagan temples. Wow, what a threesome you have sitting next to one another, okay? Now, you contrast this congregation, this city, Sardis, and contrast it with Smyrna, we looked at it last week, and Philadelphia, we're going to look at it in a few moments. Smyrna and Philadelphia had their run-ins with the unbelieving Jewish population. Sardis didn't have that problem. Not at all. In fact, Sardis, the believers in Sardis, blended in very well with the the unbelieving Jewish population. And if if the believers in Sardis blended in very well with the unbelieving Jewish population, which, by the way, was very influential, which, by, by the way, was very wealthy, well, then you can understand how the, Jew, how the believers in Sardis also blended in very well with the city establishment as a whole. Very comfortable. Very comfortable. And Yeshua says, I know your deeds. I know your deeds. That you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. I know you're alive. I know you're there. You exist, right? But you're dead. In reality, they were dead. Okay? And Yeshua, in verse 2, he says, wake up. Now, every now and then in Scripture, Yeshua shows his sense of humor. You never say that God doesn't have a sense of humor. Right? This is one of them. There were two times in, in Sardis history where Sardis was overrun by invaders. And it's not like an enemy came in with this powerful military, powerful army, weaponry, and everything like that. No, no. The two times that Sardis had been overrun by, by invaders was the times when the watchmen, who were supposed to keep watch over the city, fell asleep. They literally fell asleep. And the invaders marched right on in, and overtook the city. And it didn't happen once, it happened twice. (laughs) So when Yeshua says, wake up, you can tell the kind of smack that that kind of sounded, a little bit of sarcasm there. Verse 3, you know what you've been taught. You need to repent. You better wake up. If you do not wake up, he says, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come. So you have this, a, a, a very influential city, a, a city with great resources, right? A, a powerful city that could somehow or other be easily captured and has shown that was easily easily captured on, a, on several occasions. Why? Because the people, and in particular the congregation there in Sardis, were sleeping, and they were so wrapped up in their own world and in their own desires, and in their own life, and their own wants, and their own bank account, and they're and they're building their own little empire. They were so wrapped up in themselves, they couldn't see when danger was right around the corner. Verse 4, 
But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. There's a few of them out there. There's a remnant there that it's real, it's true to them, right? They haven't soiled themselves, but the majority have. In the ancient world, the heathen, when they would go to the pagan temples, even the heathen showed reverence. And the pagans would walk into their pagan temples. They never walked in with soiled garments. Never. They, more often than not, they would, they would wear white or linen. The pagans. <laughs> and so sometimes I, I scratch my head and I think to myself, I, if, the, if, if, if the heathen could show pagan deities or, or I mean, uh, false gods and everything, that kind of reverence, I, come, I sometimes scratch my head when I see how some people come to a worship service, right? Or when people come to shul or when people go to church and, and it's like, I, I don't know, wh- where are you going? <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you going to a, a company picnic? Are, are you going to a ball game? You know, or are you going to the nightclub, right? We talked about that last week. I, I wonder, it's like reverence, show reverence. I'm not saying all the guys, we, we got to buy, you know, $1,500 Armani suits, and the, all the ladies got to have, you know, five, seven hundred dollar, dollar ball gowns. No. Reverence. Reverence. That's all. Respect. Respect for the place. We're making a holy convocation. I, I sometimes wonder. But it, as you see in this, it's not like, well, it's not like Yeshua is severely chastising them. But it's not exactly like he's, com- he's commending them either. Because they were guided by their culture. They were guided by society. And folks, when you let culture, when you let society dictate your lifestyle, how you're going to live, all right, as believers, we're going to have some problems. You're going to have some problems. Case in point, Nazi Germany. When Hitler became chancellor, right, and, and he started spewing his ideology. At the time, there were, from what I read, anywhere from 7,000 to perhaps 15,000 good Bible-believing Christian pastors throughout Germany who, who listened to Hitler and said, wait a minute, his words don't match up with Scripture. There, there's a problem there. He, he, he's preaching an ideology that's demonic. Guess what Hitler did? He didn't silence them. No. No. You know what he did to sil- you know what he did to shut them up? He wooed them. He wooed them. J- just like a just like a guy seeing a, a pretty lady. Ooh, I love your hair. Wow, you have such pretty eyes. Oh, I, I what what a wonderful dress. And and the music and the roses and then and Hitler wooed the pastors and one by one by one they started just dropping off. And the voice got a little bit softer, and the voice got a little bit softer, and the voice got a little bit softer. One man, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, stood up and says, no, 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 no. This man is preaching hate. It's demonic. And he was silenced with his own life. Culture. Do we, do we blend in with the culture? Do we blend in with society? Or are we going to take a stand for God's word and live according to God's word? See, he who overcomes, verse 5, will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. Culture, all right? Here's one of the problems. Many churches in this country, many churches, right? The culture says that homosexuality is an accepted lifestyle. And folks, that didn't happen overnight. That's little, little spoonfuls down through the years. And now we've come all the way to 2019 where it's an accepted lifestyle. We're even voting them into office. But my Bible says it's an abomination. And God hates it. Hates it. See, the culture says otherwise. The culture says that abortion is a, an accepted form of birth control. My Bible says it's murder. And now, we're, now we have politicians who are in office saying, well, yeah, it's fine, it's quite all right to abort a child well into the third trimester. 
And we've got nurses, and I read the stories of nurses in these abortion clinics who heard the babies crying as they were being destroyed. That's what's happening in our culture, in our society. And you know what disappoints me more than anything is we've got men that are standing at pulpits on on TV, and they've got a camera in front of them, and they've got the audience in front of them, and they could say something, and they say nothing. Silence. Why? Well, we don't want to cause waves. We talked about that earlier. We don't want to cause waves. You see, if you get up, you'll take your purse and your wallet with you. Oh, we can't have that. Those who persevere, those who overcome, Yeshua says, those are the true believers. Those are the ones that have the Holy Spirit in them. And he says, I will not erase his name from the book of life. Now, again, you've got to understand, who is John writing to? Who is Yeshua speaking to? Roman Empire, all right? If you lived in a city under the auspices of the Roman Empire, they had registries. The last thing, well, first of all, when, when somebody died, they basically erased your name from their registry. The last thing you would want is to be walking around the cities under the auspices of the Roman Empire and a guard or a soldier or some official came to you and asked for some kind of identification and you couldn't prove that you are who you are, that you belong there. That was a bad place to be. Now, you know what we do with illegal aliens? (laughs) We give them health (laughs) care. We give them health care. We give them goodies. And in fact, hey, uh, how about if we can get you to vote? Because if you vote for me, I'll give you more goodies. I'll give you more good. And that's, that's how, what we do. But at any rate, he says, I'm not going to erase your name. Can a believer lose his or her salvation? Absolutely not. Listen, we looked at it several weeks ago in Romans. Before the world was ever created, if you're sitting here saved, God foreknew you. He foreknew you. That means, all right, Harold Rosen, I'm going to save him. Then he predestined me, which means what? Okay, now that I've chosen you, now this is how I'm going to save you. He's going to be born to Walter and Nancy Rosen, and he's going to be taken to church, and he's going to hear the gospel. And and then in 1977, my spirit is going to remove the veil from his eyes. And then guess what? He calls me. foreknew, predestined, then you were called. Then you were called. That means at that day, 1977, the gospel hit my ears as a little one. It was seven. I went to my room. I remember I I was in my bedroom, and I understood what the Lord had done for me. I heard the call, and I was obedient to it. The veil had been been removed from my eyes. Then what did he do? What did he do? He justified me. So he imputed his righteousness to me, and now I'm declared not guilty before God. Now I've been foreknew me, predestined me, called me, justified me. What's the last one? Glorified me. Now wait a minute. We talked about it the other week, right? Glorified. But I'm not in a glorified body yet. As far as he is concerned, I am. Because God sees everything at one time. He sits outside of time. He sees the past, the present, and the future all at one time. So my glorification, my resurrected body, as far as he's concerned, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Yeshua told his own disciples in Luke 10, 20, your names are written in heaven. The author of Hebrews chapter 12 says, when you get saved, your names are enrolled in heaven, never to be taken away. All right, so let's wrap up Sardis. What do we learn from this? Do not grow comfortable where you are. Don't grow comfortable. Don't, don't get lazy, <laughs> right? If, if you were thirsty, you hadn't drank anything for a day or two, and I handed you a cup, and I said, here's two bodies of water, right? This one, it's a, it's a mountain stream. The water's flowing down it. Look at that water coming down it. Over here, there's this pond, rather stagnant. It's kind of got a green film on it. You see all the mosquitoes? Where would you go? Don't get comfortable. Comfortable believers are stagnant disease believers, okay? All right, let's continue verse 7. And to the messenger of the congregation of Philadelphia write, 
He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. We know that the, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? It's not enough. You've got to have a love for the lost. We've got to have a love for the lost. Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the gateway to the east. Philadelphia was, was called Little Athens. Philadelphia sat on this main route from the imperial post to the east. And so Philadelphia, if, if you wanted to advance, if you wanted to, to be, become a success, you could go to Philadelphia. Here's the, here's the one problem, the big problem that Philadelphia had, ancient Philadelphia. Geographically speaking, it sat on a fault. And Josephine would know coming from California, all right? And San Francisco, that whole area, it's, it's, it sits in a place where an earthquake could happen at any day, all right? And one hit San Francisco back in 1906, destroyed the city. My grandmother on my mother's side was born one month after that earthquake hit. So Philadelphia sat on this geological fault. And back in the year 17 before the Common Era, a massive earthquake hit Philadelphia, destroyed that city, destroyed Sardis, and destroyed about 10 other cities all around it. Many people picked up whatever they could and they left. And they went and they settled down somewhere else. Philadelphia was rebuilt. But as you would expect, it was hard to get people to come back. Some people did, but they trickled in. They trickled in. And you, as you can imagine, the same with the congregation. It was a small congregation. Why? Man, I mean, we just went through that earthquake that happened decades ago. We want to do this again? Yeshua says he's holy and the one who is true. In a world of false gods, he's the one true God. He's true. He's true. That, that means he hates sin and will judge sin. And he will vindicate those who are innocent and those who have been abused. He will. He will. And he says he's the one who has the key of David. When you have a key to something, you have the authority to use it. You have a key to your car, right? You can drive it. I can't. Uh, we have a key to our home. You can't get in. We can. Yeshua says, I have the key. So he has the authority. Over what? David. Meaning what? The kingdom. He has the authority. He has the authority to allow whoever he wants in. He also has the authority to say no. No. And in verse 8, he says, Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut. When God, we talked about this Tuesday night as well, when God gives you an opportunity, you better take it. When he opens a door, whatever it is, whether it's a relationship, whether it's finances, whether it's ministry, whatever it is, when he opens a door, you better walk through it. Conversely, when he closes a door, don't you dare try and open it. Don't, don't even, don't pull on that doorknob. Because I'm going to tell you what, if you do, see, he knows what's on the other side of that door. You don't. Oh, he'll let you open it. And you will pay the consequences. He'll give you what you want. And you will learn the lot. When he, when he opens the door, walk right through it. When he closes it, don't you dare try to open it. 
And here Yeshua is giving them an opportunity here in Philadelphia. I'm going to open this door for you. I'm going to open up a door for you to proclaim my name and my goodness and my salvation. I'm going to give you this opportunity. There's going to be two obstacles that Philadelphia is going to encounter. The first one is lack of strength. He says, because you have little power. Right? Philadelphia, the city was struggling to come back, and the shul was struggling to come back. And he says, I know, you're little. You're little. Look, look around. We're not a big place. Don't look at the size. Look at the size of the God. All right? Don't look at our strength. Look at the strength of our God. Genesis 1.1. That's our God. <laughs> Don't get wrapped up in, wow, what a small little place. Ooh. See, God can do mighty things with, with little things. He turned the world upside down with 12 apostles. He can certainly do the same with us. So here, you lack the strength, you lack the power. Okay, I'm going to give you the. I'm going to give you everything you need. Second obstacle, you're going to encounter some opposition from the unbelieving Jewish community. Guess what? Smyrna did the same thing. Sardis, as we just looked, right? Sardis, they didn't have that problem. No, they blended in very well with the unbelieving Jewish community. Smyrna and Philadelphia, yeah, they had some issues. Verse 9, behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. And once again, as we discussed last week, you had those Jewish people, right? Remember the time you have the Roman Empire, you had two options, religiously speaking. Judaism, as defined by the Sanhedrin, or the imperial cult. Caesar is divine. you got to pick. And the believers didn't fall really under either one of them. And so what were the unbelieving Jewish people doing? They were working in cahoots with the Roman officials and the Roman guards and on and on and on to rat out the Christians. Here, there they are. Look at, look at, look at, there, there they go. They, they're over there. They're over there. And that's what they were doing teaching another gospel, synagogue of Satan. Any, any place, any religion, any cult, anything that says that you can get to heaven by any other means than Yeshua is a synagogue of Satan. They're doing the devil's work. Stand up. You're going to stand up to it. You're, you're, not, you're not big. You lack the size. You lack the strength. But stand up. To, in the face of adversity and take a stand. I'm going to open this door for you. Folks, can we do that? Can we do, can we do that with family members even? When an opportunity presents itself, can we, can we talk to our family members and say, listen, you know, Yeshua loves you. This is what he did for you. Yeah, but they'll shun me. You let, you let him handle that. We are with love to share the good news, that hope that abides in us, and we ought to share it with others who are dying. The dead, share it with them. Now, watch as we hit verse 10, Yeshua is going to give Philadelphia hope and us as well. Verse 10, because you have kept the word of my perseverance. So those who are truly saved, the believers, watch this. I will keep you from the hour of testing. Now, again, there's coming a time, as far as Philadelphia was concerned, right? Rome, their, their tolerance for Christianity and what was spreading throughout that empire, their tolerance for that is waning thin. By the time you get to the second century, the Romans were going around looking for anybody that had the scriptures and just burning them. But if you, if you found out you were a believer... If you're, are you a believer? Good. They would tie you to a stake and burn you alive. So that, that tolerance is starting to wane very thin. There's a testing that's going to come. There's a, there's a tribulation that's about to come. Well, guess what? There's also a tribulation that's about to come to us at some point. But look at what he says. I will keep you from that hour of testing. Oh, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. We're not going to get into it too much, but I'm telling you, 
when you look at the biblical calendar, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, happens before Yom Kippur. Trumpets, atonement. When people say, well, believers have to go through the tribulation. So you're saying we have to go through atonement. What do you have to atone for? I thought your atonement was settled 2,000 years ago at Golgotha. Ah, so there's going to be a separation. 1 Thessalonians 4, the trumpet's going to sound, the dead in Messiah will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds. There's going to be a separation between the saved and the lost. Wheat, tares. Alive, dead. Verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. Can you imagine how that, how, what, what a good sound that was to the people in Philadelphia who decades before, decades, their, their grandfathers or whatnot, their grandparents had suffered through that earthquake, and they had to flee the city. And he goes, guess what? You're not going to have to flee from the city I'm going to place you in. And I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. Don't worry. The city that I place you in, you will not experience calamity anymore. Ooh, what a good sound that is. Okay, so let's close up Philadelphia. What can we learn? Well, when God gives you an open door, walk through it. And when he closes a door, don't open it. (laughs) We should always be praying all the time, Lord. If this is something that is in your will, open the door for me. I'll walk through it. Give me the strength. Help me uh, uh, me to walk through the door. Lord, if this is not what you want, close the door and don't let me walk through it. I don't want to do anything outside of your will. Don't miss out on opportunities. 1 John 2.28, now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him. In shame at his coming. Think about all the opportunities that we've already blown. We had opportunities and we didn't take them. And now who, who of us, when we see Yeshua face to face, do you want to stand in front of him ashamed? Or do you want to hear him say, hey, well done? I know that's what you want. Well done. Trust in him. Look for the opportunities. All right, let's continue. Let's wrap it up. 14, to the messenger of the congregation of Laodicea, right? The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to avoid, uh, anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. If he, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the congregations. Laodicea was well known for Helios and Hera and Zeus and Athena. All those cults flourished, thoroughly flourished throughout Laodicea. Laodicea had a significant Jewish population. Uh, a wealthy and influential Jewish population. This particular Jewish population in Laodicea blended in very well with the Greek culture, what we simply call Hellenism. Hellenism. Laodicea was a very wealthy city. Laodicea was a city that was well known for its banking network. And so you have this city that could provide, once again, many opportunities for financial advancement. Of all the the pluses that you could look at this city, right, there was one thing that Laodicea lacked. And it's the most important element of all. Water. (laughs) 
water. The water supply that Laodicea had was pathetic. It was unusable. Uh, Large amounts of sediments in the water. Uh, lime deposits in the water. It could not be used. Uh, Laodicea was cut off from uh, the cold mountain that came, the mountains, that, the, the water that would come off the mountains. Laodicea was shut off from the hot water that could be found in springs. So it had no proper water supply. And so what Laodicea did was it built an aqueduct from the south and pumped water into the city. Now imagine if you wanted to sabotage a city, <laughs> even a city like Laodicea that had all the banks and, and all that, you know what? Let's cut off the water. Man, you can't go four days without water. So there was an aqueduct that went from the south and made its way into Laodicea. Can you imagine then if you were to taste that water, by the time it got to the city, was it hot? No. Was it cold? No, it was lukewarm. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. When you go to a restaurant, a good waiter or waitress, if you're drinking coffee or hot tea, what do they do? They always make sure your cup is filled. Why? No one wants to drink lukewarm coffee. I like iced coffee, but I don't like lukewarm coffee, (laughs) right? All right. If you've got an iced tea or an iced water, they'll come by, a good waiter or waitress, because I see those things. If you're constantly filling my glass, okay, yeah, you want a tip. That's okay, I got you. You know, because they want to keep your your iced water cold. They want ice in there. Let me teach you the law of thermodynamics really quick. In a closed system, the law of thermodynamics, in a closed system, elements moderate and no energy can be produced. If something isn't brought in from the outside into the closed system, eventually all the, everything that's in the closed system will decay, will decay, will moderate, decay, and rot, die. The perfect example of this, each and every one of you have it in, their, in your home. It's called a refrigerator. And right now your refrigerator is plugged into the wall. And so as the temperature in the refrigerator starts to go up, there's a thermostat. And as soon as it hits it, what happens? Motor kicks on and everything, it starts to cool everything in the refrigerator, keeping everything in the freezer frozen, right? But if you pull the plug on that refrigerator and you wait and wait and wait, All right, eventually it will take time. Everything on the inside of that refrigerator will become the same temperature as what is on the outside of the refrigerator and it will decay and it will rot. Yeshua said what? I'm the vine, you're the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. Those of you who like to plant and fruit trees and things like that, right? Snap off a branch off a tree in your backyard and set it on the ground. Because it'll look exactly like everything else on the tree for a while. And then watch it the next day and watch it the next day. And suddenly those green leaves start to turn brown. That's what happened to Laodicea. That's exactly what happened. I'm the vine, you're the branches. And they forgot that. And folks, when a person or a marriage or a family or a shul or a church shuts Yeshua out, I don't need Yeshua. I don't need, I don't need the vine. We, we're going we're gonna to do, you know, uh, we're going to have fun and we're going to play music and we're going to have games and we're going to have shows, but we don't need God's word. We don't need standards. We don't need holiness. We don't need, we don't need those things. We're just going to have playtime eventually that branch is going to wither and die. And that's what was happening in Laodicea. It was lukewarm. They were dying and didn't even know it. Their mindset, Yeshua says it, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Everything on the outside of the refrigerator looked good. And on the inside, everything was rotting. Smyrna, we looked at it last week. Smyrna thought they were poor 
And Yeshua said, no, you're rich. Laodicea, they thought they were rich. And Yeshua says, no, you're poor. (laughs) Because, why? They were measuring themselves by human standards instead of spiritual values. And he said, you're wretched and you're miserable and you're poor and blind and naked. All the money that they had, all the success that they had, the nice house, the nice car, the big bank account, they had all of this. And guess what? (laughs) Means nothing. Oh, foolish one, you'll die someday and you'll leave it all behind. So what's the solution? What's the solution to a pampered individual? What's the solution to a sleepy congregation? He says it, verse 18. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. Ooh, fire. Little bit of persecution. Little bit of suffering. 1 Peter 1, 7. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. Nothing will examine your priorities more than suffering. Nothing will examine your, how thankful you are for your eyesight than when you can't see. Nothing can, can, can go ahead and examine how happy you should be for your job than when you're unemployed. Nothing should be, help you. Man, I'm glad for the money in my bank until you don't have any. Or when you can't walk or when you can't hear, or when, fa- or when family, pro- family problems are starting to happen. You'll never, ex- you'll never appreciate what you've got until those things start to fade away. Suffering. We don't like to suffer. He says, white garments so that you may clothe yourself. So shame of your nakedness. They thought they had clothes on and they were naked. They thought they were wealthy and they were poor. Look, an eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. They were blind. They couldn't see. See, we as believers, right? Where you go, Christians, Messianic, whatever. We love, we we love the salvation messages. Ooh, I've I've been told that already. Why why do you why don't you why don't you preach about the cross more? Why don't you preach about and it's like, okay, but if people are saved already, don't isn't there like a sanctification that we have to go through? See, we all like the justification part, right? The justification. Messiah imputed his righteousness to me. That, it's like a, a, like a check. He wrote out the check, and he deposited it in my, account, in my account. His righteousness belongs to me. We love that part. I'm not guilty. Woo! Guess what? Sanctification. See, now the very same righteousness that he imputed to me is also imparted to me. Which means what? Which means that his righteousness has to change my character, my conduct. I can't do the things I used to do. I can't say the things I want to say or I used to say. Yeshua is saying, I bought you with a price. You don't belong to yourself anymore. I'm the, I'm the master potter here. You're just a lump of clay on my wheel. And you know what the master potter does? He goes and he molds and that wheel is spinning and he shapes and he shapes. And you know what he's doing? He's feeling for the inconsistencies in the, in the clay. That's what he does. And he feels. And once he feels inconsistencies, you know what he does? <laughs> Press it all back down again and start all over again. We're going to start all over and we're going to go. And then when he finally, okay, I think I got it exactly where I want it. Guess what he's got to do? He's got to stick it in the oven. And then he puts us in the fire, right? And then a potter, what he'll do is, after it's been in the fire for a while, guess what he'll do? He'll take it out and usually go like this. And he listens. And you know what he's listening for? He's listening for a sound like a singing. Because that's when the vessel is done. That's when it's ready to be used. And if he doesn't hear the singing, guess what he does? He puts it back into the fire again. It's not done. So the next time God puts you through some kind of test and puts you in an oven and puts you in the fire and he kind of takes you out, you better be singing because if not, you're going to go back in. (laughs) Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. I reprove and I discipline. If he's not disciplining you, you've got problems. 
That means he sees something in you. I see something in you. I can make something out of you. I'm gonna, you might not like it, but I'm going to make it you into something. For some reason, he took, some, he took a, a, a filthy mouth rebel of a person, Harold Rosen, about 20 years ago, who ran from it and ran from it, and somehow or other he said, no, 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 no. You're not going to have it your way. You're going to have it my way. I'm going to make you into something. And here I'm standing here, and he's still making me into something. He's got a long way to go. But it's like, I, I, I got I to gotta have you into the vessel that I can use. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him. And he with me. How many times have you heard that verse being used as far as like coming to faith? No. (laughs) He's talking to believers. He's talking to you and me. He's talking to those of us. Guess what? We pulled the plug on the refrigerator. And he says, listen, you can't do anything without me. So guess what? I'm going to stand here. I'm going to knock. And I'm going to knock on this door until you let me back in again. Because without me, you can do nothing. You're an unplugged refrigerator. You need to plug yourself back in again. You need me. You need to open the door to the refrigerator so I can cool you off and freeze everything up again. I'm waiting. In conclusion, see, listen. Just because Yeshua is your Savior doesn't mean he's your Lord. And just because he may be your Redeemer doesn't mean that he's your Master. We have to allow his Spirit to mold us and make us and shape us into what he needs us to be. And folks, that's that's a painful process. And we don't like that. And we fight against him because I want to do what I want to do. And he says, no, no, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to me, and I've got plans for you. So open, walk through the open doors. Allow his spirit to make you into what he needs you to be. It might be painful. You might cry an awful lot. (laughs) Trust me, he knows what's best. He knows what's best, and he'll bless you mightily. Let's pray.